All right, so this is the chapter overview video for chapter 10, Fixed Axis Rotation. This is the first of the chapters that covers what I'm going to call rigid body motion, by which I mean um, it's a combination of translational motion that we've been covering and now the rotational motion. Now, um, your textbook covers topics in a quite different order from you will see in the lecture. I recommend that you try both approaches and whichever one helps you understand the physics better, <laughs> go with that. Um, for the purpose of this overview video, I'll just uh, go in the order your textbook sections are in. And I will just talk about, um, briefly mention the parts where I cover it slightly differently. So, um, so this is the, the introduction page for the chapter. Yeah. Um, yeah. So rotational variables, that's the uh, beginning place. The way we begin this semester with the, with the uh, kinematics. We started uh, with the position, velocity, acceleration. So your textbook is doing a version of that in the rotational context. Here's the rotational version of velocity, angular velocity. And um, here's the, oh, oh, and as they're introducing, I guess they are, um, um, intro, uh, relating the angular quantity to the, the translational quantities, the arc length. I like to call this uh, the definition of radian <laughs> because um, it, it's kind of the natural unit of angle, not the arbitrary unit like degrees. Um, so the, this is the kind of the introduction of those variables. It's a quite a bit more formal than um, I do in lecture. <laughs> you see all these derivatives. Um, and um, so, you know, when I introduce this, I say this comes naturally from definition of radian. Your textbook goes through this calculus derivation. Look at them both. Um, I, I do think uh, uh, kind of getting familiar with some formalism, especially at this point in the semester, can be beneficial for you. So do that. Um, the, the Describing the rotational quantities as a vector using a right-hand rule. Uh, I do that later. Um, it's going to be in the same week, but I'm going to be covering it in the context where I do chapter 11 material. So right now, at this point in the chapter 10, um, uh, it read, skim it, and then kind of you can um, <laughs> read through. I guess your textbook does this because in your textbook, the cross product was covered way earlier in chapter 2. They covered it under section 2.4. So review there can be useful. Um, so, so this is the, the rotational variables. They um, also introduced the uh, angular version of acceleration called angular acceleration, rotational version of acceleration. And they relate it to the, the rotational version of velocity, the angular uh, velocity omega. And, um, and this is the Greek letter alpha. Um, yeah, and uh, so your textbook introduces these variables a little bit earlier than I do. So when you see me cover this in lecture, in lecture, I'll start out with a torque, introduction of torque, actually. Um, but the, the first three sections of chapter 10 is spent on rotational kinematics. And as you do rotational kinematics, uh, what I want you to focus on is what I call analogy uh, between translational motion and uh, rotational motion. And I don't think your textbook um, mentions it specifically, <laughs> but I think, I hope as you look through it, you will kind of see the analogy. This is the average angular velocity um, in the context of constant angular acceleration. And this looks exactly like the average velocity in the context of constant translational acceleration. Average velocity in the context was initial velocity plus the final velocity divided by two. So here you just replace each one of those with the angular version of those quantities. Um, same thing with how we do ang acceleration, angular acceleration related to angular velocity this way. And they derive the kinematics formulas that you have seen in the um, in the translational motion context. Imagine replacing each of these quantities with the, um, um, so you can go either way. You can take this uh, equation 10.12 and replace theta with x and omega with v and alpha with a 
and you will see the, the kinematics equation you've seen in chapter 3. Or I like to go the other way, start with the translational kinematics equation that you have seen in chapter 3, replace each one of the quantities with the rotational version of them, then you get equation 10.12. You don't have to redrive it. You don't have to memorize it. It just uh, naturally comes from the, 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 what you already know. Your textbook calls it rotational counterpart. The language I uh, prefer to use is what we call analogy. And um, it does talk about highly analogous. And this analogy really helps you. It helps you, one, review the kinematics that we covered way back. And, you know, back then at the beginning of the semester, maybe not all of it made sense. When we cover rotation, this is a great chance to review it. So, so um, you will see me in lecture really rely on this analogy between um, the translational motion and rotational motion. And all these equations, you have a translational version of it, so I never really memorized these separately. I just appealed to me having memorized the V squared formula that already tells me what the omega squared formula should look like by replacing each of the quantities with the rotational version. So that's the rotation with the constant angular acceleration. This is like chapter three, jam-packed into one, because <laughs> this is kind of the content that you've already covered. And now in section 10.3 is where they give you kind of the summary table of linear and rotational quantities, and you will see similar summary table in the lecture. And um, the thing that to, to watch out for is to kind of separate in your head one type of acceleration we've covered with the rotation before, what we call the centripetal acceleration. That's the kind of acceleration that's pointing towards the center of the circle. Be careful to distinguish that from the tangential acceleration, which is going to be related to changing the, the, the rotational speed. And this is what's going to be associated with angular acceleration. So um, just be careful to separate those out. I don't think I give you a lot of questions where you have to both deal with centripetal and angular acceleration, but still um, those two watch out. These, uh, one way to kind of keep them separated and remember is there are the two perpendicular directions. So they are kind of the rotational version of the x-axis and the y-axis or the x-axis or the y-axis. They are perpendicular, they are the you know, orthogonal components of acceleration. And yeah, this is how you do describe acceleration in general. So yeah, the summary tables, um, um, I, I wouldn't say memorize them because you know what's on the right-hand side here is hopefully something that you already memorized. And what's on the left-hand side, you don't have to memorize it separately. Just um, um, if you learn how to apply the rotational analogs, then you can go from here to here by replacing each of the quantities with the rotational counterpart, the way your textbook calls it. So, um, and this uh, is uh, um, this is the way in the context where you need it. This is how you do relate the, the say angular change with um, the arc length or the translational distance. And these relationships are really helpful when you are dealing with something called rolling without slipping that you will see in chapter eleven. So that's this section. So um, one side so. So once I cover um, rotational kinematics, uh, the approach you see in lecture will be quite similar to sections 10.1 to 3. Now, where your textbook and I depart is how we introduce moment of inertia and how we handle rotational dynamics. So as I mentioned, the place I, I like to start with is torque. Because I think, uh, you know, we started out with a force and torque is the rotational version of force. Your textbook does it a little bit differently, um, which is also valid. It's just not the way I do it. Um, so they start out with the rotational kinetic energy, and they start out with the, the, the kinetic energy you've already seen, and you know one half mv squared, where v is the, the tangential velocity, and they replace this with the, the relationships that they introduced before, and they are wanting to write it in this way, one half times something times rotational version of velocity squared. And now what they are identifying is this uh, uh, grouping of terms that you would need to have, mass times the distance squared. 
um, they want to give it a, a special meaning. And the special meaning that they give is a uh, moment of inertia. So, you know, uh, we need to find a way to generalize it. And the way to generalize it is to define a new quantity called the moment of inertia or rotational inertia. That's going to be a rotational version of inertia <laughs> a mass. So, um, so this is how your textbook introduces it. I do the same thing, except I use the context with the torque and Newton's second law. Um, I've both approaches, I think it's worth um, looking. Just uh, It's a matter of what you describe as your beginning place and where you derive the other expressions. And in my case, I guess I don't actually derive this. I just guess at it by appealing to rotational analogs, you know. Kinetic energy, okay. Um, the kinetic energy of uh, uh, the translational motion was one half mass times the velocity squared. So I look at, okay, rotational version of one half is one half. Rotational version of mass is rotational inertia that I introduced uh, with the torque earlier. And the rotational version of velocity squared is omega squared. Um, so, yeah, so you look at your textbook. Um, it's both um, kind of, I think there's a value in repetition, helping you learn. Now, with the, um, oh, so this table of rotational inertia, it's coming in a bit of a, um, I think, a, um, wrong order, because in the next section is when they're going to teach you how to derive this. Um, I guess the formulas here, what I'll say is that this is one of those things that where if you end up naturally memorizing it, great, um, you know, that kind of speeds up your problem solving. You don't really have to memorize it. Um, so back when we used to have exams, this uh, table is the kind of information that I would print out and give to people to refer to during the exam. Um, this kind of table of formulas, people don't expect you to memorize it usually. Now, you might, from your experience and how often you use it, you might have something like this naturally memorized. Great. If you don't, that's also fine. So, uh, yeah, this is like the standard strategy in the rotational context. Or I guess this is not standard strategy. It's conservation of energies. Yeah, that's why I don't like this order. I like to introduce kind of the, do the same thing that we did up here, you know, forces and then energy, except in the rotational context in the same order. But, you know, this is how your textbook does it. Different physicists are doing it differently. Now, calculating moment of inertia, it's a really great exercise. Um, in fact, uh, so, you know, in with the discrete masses, you can do it by just adding them up. Um, the continuous mass where you have to deal with the infinitesimal mass elements, uh, it's something that you will see me lecture on. And it's a one thing where I say, you know, in the exam, where we had exams, you'd have questions where you have to know how to do this find rotation inertia through direct integration. And your textbook um, presents one approach. I think it's basically the same approach that I have. You know, express your um, kind of infinitesimal masses, um, kind of representative mass this way. Write down an expression for that mass amount. Write down an expression for... Uh, I, I like to write down di, infinitesimal rotation inertia first. And then, um, you know, in thinking about how you're going to add it up, then have an integral sign. Um, and, uh, but the way you will see it in lecture and the way you see it here, it's basically the same. Um, so, yeah, and uh, it shows different. Uh, yeah, so this uh, has different limits of integration from this because um, when you are thinking of rotating about here, your x goes from uh, you know different value to different value. So a uh, parallel axis theorem, um, I think I derive it uh, by uh, considering uh, kind of um, uh, considering the total kinetic energy. When you have a, like a rolling disk, you can look at it as uh, something that has a motion of a center of mass plus rotation about the center of mass. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is as a pure rotation about the point of contact and just the thing rotating. And for those two equally valid expressions for energy to be the same, you need to introduce a term like this, how um, rotation inertia in one picture is related to the other. Your textbook does it differently. I think they just state it and apply it, which is, you know, um, and this, I think I do a similar derivation in lecture. Take a look at both. Um, 
uh, all these are important. Now, I guess uh, um, the so you I think you do have some homework question that deals with this. And depending on your luck, you might see a free form time assessment question that makes you do the integration. In if you get lucky or unlucky, depending on your perspective, you won't ever have to do the two D version of it. You may have to know how to do the one D version of it. Now, finally, we get to the material that I start this uh, um, chapter with. So um, for me, I start by defining torque. So in your uh, textbook, they um, so so do they even um, I think they just uh, just uh, define it, and I don't think they give you motivation for why they define it that way. Uh, okay, take a look at my lecture and see which one uh, you feel um, helps you understand it better. Whichever one works better, great, <laughs> use it. Whatever helps you understand the final formula that you get, all right, that's great. Um, and this is an expression for lever arm. This is a kind of special enough of quantity that it gets on its name, the perpendicular component of displacement. We call it lever arm. Um, and I give some illustration of how to find the lever arm don't think your textbook really shows the figure. Uh, you take the force, um, the the line along the force is what we call line of action, um, and you find the distance, perpendicular distance, from the axis of rotation to that line. That's the lever arm. Um, you'll see that in lecture, a visual illustration of that. Um, yeah, and Newton's second law for rotation. And because the way your textbook does it, starting out with the approaches here, they will derive Newton's second law uh, using the expression for rotation inertia that they already have. Uh, in the lecture, you will see we go the other way. We uh, basically start by with a, a desire, um, taking this uh, expression and wanting to have, um, so having found some intuitive feel for torque, um, the torque is some sort of distance times the force. Then uh, you have like torque is equal to R times this. So it becomes R squared. Uh, we start by wanting to, well, we have this rotational version of acceleration, angular acceleration. Can we com uh, combine these quantities here so that uh, we have some form of expression that looks like uh, Newton's second law? saying uh, something like a force is equal to some constant at times something like acceleration and the constant is rotation inertia. Um, uh, it's a matter of uh, which point do you use as a starting point. Your textbook used the energy as a starting point. I'll use um, Newton's second law as a starting point. Uh, it's a matter of you know bootstrapping problem. Where do you start from? So. Finally, section 10.8. It's not something that we re I really emphasize in our class. Um, I feel like a lot of this is rotational analog. Because <laughs> uh, in the um, translation of Virgil, we said the work is force times the displacement. So um, in the rotational version, work is, rotational version of work is, I guess, the work. That's uh, uh, net torque um, or torque times the angular displacement. So... Um, that's, so, you know, I don't feel like work in the rotational context is anything new. Uh, and uh, this is the rotational version of work kinetic energy theorem. You could drive it from scratch or you could get the version from the, uh, the, the translational version and replace each of the quantities with the rotational analogs. So, um, and the, the power, uh, I will just say in this class as a whole, I kind of de-emphasize power. You should know the definition of power, that it's a, a rate, of, uh, rate at which work is done or rate of change of work. But I think the class where um, the idea of power becomes more important is Physics 4B, where we talk about electrical power and possibly physics of 4c where we sometimes talk about like uh, uh, radiant power power related to uh, um, light um, so um, so know the definition of power but beyond that we don't really do much and yeah here are the summary tables you will see in lecture you have seen it throughout just note uh, how um, you don't really need to memorize the left hand side separately because you already know the right hand side and you can appeal to rotational analog to get the thing on the left-hand side, yeah, like uh, realize that.